I, I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier Chair at here at CSIS and run the project on Prosperity and Development. It's a real uh, privilege and pleasure to have Jonathan Berman to talk about his new book called Success in Africa, which I've read and I commend to all of you to actually read. I hope you buy it retail on, on Amazon or go to your local bookstore like Politics and Prose where I know they're selling it and go out and buy it. Um, it's been endorsed by a slew of very impressive and thoughtful people that are friends of CSIS as well as their well household names. President Clinton uh, endorsed the book and actually read the book. We were having this discussion earlier. I, we know he you know, read it cover to cover and, and I know he did. And um, Folks like Neville Isdell who's on our board here at CSIS who's a very serious Africanist and was an Africanist before Africa was cool. Um, is who's on the CSIS board has also read it and is also someone who's interviewed here in the um, in the book as well. I want to recognize my friend Jennifer Cook who's here who runs our Africa program as well as my friend Tony Carroll who's also affiliated with with, with, with Jennifer Cook's program and um, want to just recognize them uh, and I know there are other folks here as well who are very thoughtful people and know a lot about Africa as well but uh, um, want to just give you a quick bi biographical sketch about Jonathan, my quick thoughts about the book and then I've got a couple questions for Jonathan and then we can open it up because I know this is a very thoughtful audience. And Jonathan had a, had a graduate of Yale, grew up in Brooklyn. The Bronx. The Bronx, sorry. Sorry, grew up in New York City uh, and went to Yale uh, and then uh, has had a career in strategy consulting, did a detour into development consulting for a while and has merged the two with Dahlberg, which is a well-known um, development cons strategy consulting firm that has an office here in Washington um, and has um, also has an affiliation with the, with the Valle Center at Columbia University. He's a senior fellow there and, and retains an affiliation with Dahlberg, but took a year off to, to write the book. Um, I found the book very interesting. I found the chapter in particular about China interesting. I know this is a, a topic of great energy here in Washington and generates a lot of interest. And for folks in the policy community, like myself, I'm particularly energized as an American about the, the China-Africa relationship. There were a couple surprises I found in here about the China-Africa relationship. For those of you that follow this more carefully than I do, they won't be as surprising, but I, I thought there were some, some particularly interesting uh, factoids that, that come up in the book uh, about the China-Africa relationship. One was that there are, if you go on Google, they, there's two billion hits if you Google Africa and China, and there are 2.2 million uh, scholarly articles uh, on Africa and China. 2.2 million uh, artic scholarly articles on Africa and China, which I find shocking. Uh, and I think Jonathan's point in the book is, uh, you know, I don't, he doesn't think there are probably that many scholarly articles about African success in Africa, and I think he's absolutely right. So I think perhaps there's a, a little bit of a hyperventilation or, or some energy around sort of that, that specific topic. I know we're going to get into it later, and I hope there'll be other fo folks here as well who will, um, who will have thoughts about this. Um, but that was, that was one thing. I also thought there were some very other interesting insights about the relationship between China and Africa. Um, Jonathan interviewed a series of very interesting current and former CEOs, African CEOs, African leaders, American leaders who've been uh, serious players in, in Africa, some who I didn't know anything about. Jeff Immelt it comes up often in the book and uh, GE has been really a Siri gone very uh, big into Africa. We have a relationship here at CSIS with GE and it's quite clear from our interactions with them. But also Cummins, the, uh, the industrial company out of Indiana, has made a major thoughtful effort uh, in Africa over the last 10 years. And I know Jonathan will talk about it, but um, there are just a couple things that, that came about, the, about this in particular, about the China-Africa relationship. And then I will p pop some questions over to Jonathan. But one was, that Mo Ibrahim, who's the legendary founder of Celtel, the cell phone company, said, okay, um, U.S. friends talk to us that Africa has been an unfaithful business partner that now is trading with China and that we are at risk from it. But Mo then goes on to say, but the number one trading partner of China is the United States. So why is it so good for the United States to trade with China and why is it bad for Africa, which I think is a... <laughs> A pretty good point. So I thought that was I thought that was particularly interesting. There are many insights like this. I use the China Africa example in particular just to pull some things out. Let me just draw out one other thing. He has a very interesting chapter on what does this mean for the United States, and then I um, and one of the things I took away from the conversation was 
the issue of training, American business training, and that the American companies, multinational companies commitment to training, it's investing in people and investing in local communities is something that's a unique distinguisher of the United States in Africa. Uh, but I, I'm, I won't reveal all the interesting uh, nuggets that are in the book, but those were several that I, I'm particularly enthused about. Um, and so Jonathan, it's really a privilege to have you. Thanks for coming and thanks for being here. I congratulate you on the book. Thanks, Ta thanks for having me. Talk about what prompted you to, to, to do the book. Sure, sure. Uh, so first, before I do, let me just thank, thank Dan formally. D Dan is someone who I've known who's been at the intersection of business and development and politics for a long time, and not just at that intersection, but driving it forward in the right place. Thank so you. I'm, I'm very glad to, to be in his company and to be here at CSIS. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, you know, the, the, I think it's a reasonable question why I would write this book. I think it's also a reasonable question to ask, how could I possibly be the right guy to write this book? As, as uh, Dan almost mentioned, I'm, I'm, I'm from the Bronx. Excuse uh, me. With, uh, <laughs> uh, talk, talk about, you know. A, a major faux pas. Yeah. So talk about subnational conflict. Oh, I know. <laughs> uh, uh, but that's a long way from Africa. Uh, and originally, I'm not an Africa specialist. I, I began my career as, a, as an Asia specialist. My Chinese coming out of school was pretty good, much better than now. Uh, and I bounced around Greater China for about 10 years, working on a variety of strategy and strategy consulting projects. And along the way, got a really good sense for what an, an emerging fast growth economy looks like and what the political econ econ and economic dynamics of, of that change are. Uh, and not just looks like, but sort of feels like. You get a feel for the vibrancy of a market that's exploding. The first time I landed in Lagos, I could tell that that was what was happening in Africa. Uh, and you can feel it again, you can feel it in Nairobi, you can feel it in Accra today. Uh, you know, this sort of hum of activity that really does, if you've, if you've felt it before, you know, you know that that's where you are. Uh, several years into working in it, and so I began to work a little more in Africa with some of the companies that I had uh, developed relationships with in Asia. And a few years in, I realized I was living sort of a parallel life, that, that, that when I was working in Africa or with people who were investing in Africa, Everybody knew the story. It was a foregone conclusion that Africa was growing, growing all around us, right? Because they could all feel the same thing I could, and a lot of people were, are, were and are making good money. As soon as I stepped off that plane or went through a transfer in Geneva or Frankfurt or came down to the US and talked to somebody here, it was like I was in another world. No one knew that Africa was growing at that point. There was just this, this impression that's reinforced by our media and our entertainment of sort of uh, happy animals and miserable people. But that's the story of Africa. So, so there were these two parallel worlds. And at the same time, uh, I found that I was talking in Africa, engaging with some of the most dynamic, thoughtful, uh, charismatic executives I had ever met in my life, anywhere, here in Asia, in Africa, anywhere. And I thought, ah, that's how I'll actually, that's how it actually resolve the sort of these parallel universes is by talking about these people, a new narrative of Africa with the characters who are inhabiting it today, not the characters you find like in The Lion King. And so that's who, that's who the book is about, really. And that's, what the, that's the book's contents, is getting those people to talk about the issues that most Americans certainly, and I think generally most business readers, are interested in, interested in about Africa. Who would I work with there? What is the like work with the government? What about the Chinese? What are the opportunities for Americans? Those are the questions that I took forward from, from the, the, the people that I knew here and brought to the executives I knew there. Great. Well, talk about some of your, some of your bigger takeaways or findings. I mean, you certainly talked to the right people. I, I was fascinated by the cast of characters that you present in the book various expat entrepreneurs, an Irishman who sets up an oil company, knew nothing about the oil industry, a series of one charismatic African CEO after another, phenomenally successful. Talk, you know, talk, talk about, talk about what, what some of your, in your mind, some of the key takeaways were in your mind about this. Yeah, well, you know, maybe I'll start by talking about who, who they are yeah. writ large, and then we can go into yeah. specifics that you, you know, maybe you, yep. you want to direct. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to say that g generalizing about Africa is always done at your peril, right? There's 54 or maybe 55 countries, depending who's, who, who you're asking. Uh, and even within that, there's a lot of subnational divisions, as, as furious as that between the Bronx and Brooklyn. <laughs> uh, uh, so you do it at your peril. Having said that, 
I do do it. Uh, and in fact, I have a whole chapter describing why I think Africa as a whole makes sense. And we can, we can talk a little more about that. But I think it is valuable and important to talk about Africa as a whole. Uh, and so I'll, I'll, I'll dare to take that risk on of generalizing, and then you guys can push back on me. Uh, one thing I'll point out is that uh, the, the men and women driving Africa's growth, let's start with this, they're African, right? We tend to think of Western aid or Chinese demand or this commodity super cycle uh, as driving the growth in Africa. They're all inputs. But if you talk to the CEOs who are succeeding in Africa, they're not the core inputs. The core inputs are education, uh, connectivity, better governance, all being driven by Africans themselves. So let's let's start with that, and then the Africa, and then the, the the men the men and women leading the most productive enterprises on the continent are themselves also Africans. Whether expatri whether they went abroad and came back with education, like Fatou Aleko, the chairman of MTN, which is now the the seventh largest phone company in the world, Good Lord. right? Or whether they're someone like Tony Elumelu, the chairman of Transcorp and Ayers Holding, who's building the largest power plant in Nigeria. Born, born, bred, and educated in, in Nigeria. James Mwangi of Equity Bank, the same in Kenya, right? So they, whether they're coming back, whether they're returnees or have stayed there throughout, you know, these are the people at the heart of the story. And let's not, it's easy, I think, sitting here, and I imagine sitting in Beijing, to lose track of that. Though, though I, su I submit we, we might lose track of it a little more easily than they. Uh, second, the, mo the, 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 the modern African CEO is not the past model of African business leadership. I think it's fair to say that there is a very large cadre of, of African business leaders of the past whose uh, principal stock and trade were political relationships and their ability essentially to extract rents from the countries around, from, 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 their, from their native land. That is not what you see today and doesn't describe any of the men I just, I just mentioned, nor does it describe Fenke, Funke Opeke, a, a, a woman who's the CEO in, of Main One Cable in Nigeria. These are, to a man and woman, uh, business executives who are leading productive, competitive enterprises. And you can see it because in many cases, they are transnational enterprises. Most of these companies do not uh, suffice to stay within one market, even a large market like Nigeria. Because of the nature of their enterprise, because they are productive and competitive, they have the opportunity to jump those boundaries. That's a big difference over, over earlier, earlier generations of African business leadership. Uh, the uh, one of the things I took away was this issue of regionalization and sort of looking at and you, you talk about I, I actually do agree with you can I think you can take a risk of making some generalities and, and you quote Mo Ibrahim and talking about that as well and use the example of the World Cup in Ga Ghana and various African uh, friends and colleagues uh, sort of sol demonstrating solidarity with Ghana in their quest in in the World Cup as sort of an example yeah. of this. Uh, but but talk a little bit about um, the in, in terms of some of the additional changes that have happened in Africa. You have in the beginning of the, in, in the chapter some of the reforms that have happened to sort of make make this make this. You talked about governance. You talked about some other things that were sort of laid the groundwork, if you will, for sort of this. If you can, um, re, emergence isn't the word, and you and you talk about that word, sort of a reemergence or a re reconnectivity and or sort of a. A, a, an African renaissance, if we can call it that. How's that? Yeah. Uh, so you talk about, one about some, some of the drivers of that. Some of the drivers of that, sure, yes. Sure, sure. So uh, briefly on each of the, I mentioned three areas that, I've, that I view as most core to a very complex and nuanced decades-long process, and they are education, governance, and connectivity. So briefly in each one, uh, in education, uh, Africa doesn't underinvest in education. There are challenges with how well, it's, how well the education is delivered. But Africa delivers education at twice the annual portion, at, at twice a portion of their budget as we do of ours, right? 22% versus 11% of budget. Uh, and, and that has yielded results that are uneven across the continent, but are significant. At the same time, there's a cadre, sort of a commercial class of uh, rising managers and chief executives that have returned from uh, expatriate education, whether in, the, in, in, in Europe or particularly in this country. You know, James Mwangi, the, the Forbes Africa Man of the Year, said to me, he said, uh, you know, you, when you're dealing with a chief executive of a, of a Kenyan company today, he typically will have had, mul had multiple advanced degrees from overseas. He's had basically the same education that you've had, but you're treating him as if he's his father with his mission education. 
And that's the mistake that Americans are often making. So that's a big revolution, even if it's in a small class, it's a small but critical class of movers on the continent. J just on this issue, talk about governance. Yeah. Well. So in governance, I think there, that, that, first of all, that same process has happened on the government side. It's just a better educated class of, of, of people governing. But also, much of, so much of Africa, especially Southern Africa, has moved through a generation of colonial and then post-colonial management and governance and, move, and, and sort of had that, had that post-colonial government fail and decided that it's had, and it's had enough with it and replaced it with a more technocratic generation of leaders. I dare say that we, that's what we're seeing in South Africa right now. In this regard, South Africa is it's a, a few decades behind, exactly, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is lagging behind much of the rest of Africa in the evolution from the post-colonial uh, champion to whatever will emerge that I'm sure is going to be more technocratic. And you, talk, you talked about infrastructure. I think you mean by that things like telephony or connectivity in particular. So that's the connectivity part. That's right. Now, I What's think, the cell phone? How many cell phones are there in Africa today? Yeah, that's right. I, I, if I recall the numbers correctly, there's 780 pushing towards 800 million in cell Africa. phones in Africa today. Yeah, connect, connections in Africa. Yes. A, and the, some subset of that have the ability to make e-payments on M-Pesa and those sorts of things. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's in the tens of millions. In, in, fact, all of, in fact, all of them do. Because one of the, one of the uh, well, all of them have that capacity. Not all, not all countries in Africa have a have that ability system like M-Pesa. But M-Pesa, uh, like most of the innovations in Africa on mobile, are designed to work on a feature phone, on what we call a dumb phone. Only uh, right now, I think only three million of, the of those phones are smartphones today. I think they're expected to be 15 million or 15 percent of total. So it would have to be 150 million. Wow. In, uh, in, by 2015. So even then, 85 percent of that market is going to be feature phones. And what, what you can do in Nairobi with a feature phone run circles around what I can do with the iPhone I just turned off and put in my pocket. I still have trouble using my Citibank Pop Money account. I don't even know if any of you have this. We have some pale imitation of mobile money here today, but uh, you know, it takes me 10 minutes and a, and a mountain of frustration to make it move compared to what, what, what one can do in Nairobi where really you're just, you're really just texting a few numbers. There were, a, as I said earlier, there are a series of things that surprised me. There must be several insights that surprised you as you did the book that you took away. You said, I didn't expect that. What, what were those? Yeah. You know, uh, there, was, there were many, almost maybe too many to count, but I, you know, there were three or four that really stood out. One is that Africa isn't quite as, as con configured in quite the way we typically think of it. Uh, the, region, the, the relationship between different regions is changing. And so for example, South Africa today is much less part of the rest of Af Southern Africa than we think of it as. And North Africa is more. We, I don't think I know an international organization that doesn't divide North Africa whole cloth from the rest, from the rest of the continent, except companies in Africa. Companies like Atijari Wafa Bank, the largest bank in, uh, in North Africa, a Moroccan bank, whose growth strategy is entirely southern driven. Yeah. Sevital, the largest company in Algeria, entirely southern driven in their growth strategy. You'll find companies like that throughout the Maghreb pushing south. And we just, you know, our, our organizations are just not caught up with that. Similarly, from the south to the north, I think that, that, that there's a, a common conception that South Africa is the entrepot for the rest of Africa. I don't know many people outside, I don't know many African CEOs outside of South Africa who actually think that way. So that, you know, that was amongst the more surprising the, 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 the other thing I took away was one of the interviews you had with Sonny Varghese, who runs Olam, which is a big, one of the bigger agribusiness players in, in the world and in Africa, talking about that there's the potential for Africa to be self-sufficient in rice. And it's the one third of all rice inputs in the world, imports in the world come into Africa today. But he believes that over time that's going to change. So things like a green revolution, through things like food security investments, through things like private sector investments in agriculture, that 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 shocked me. Yeah, you know, I, I think probably there's people in the room who have heard of, uh, you know, that 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 Africa could feed the world. That Africa has 60 percent of wow. the uncultivated arable land in the world. Uh, but when you hear it from uh, Sonny Vergese, who, who runs one of the largest commodity firms in the world and moves more rice than anybody in the world, right? This is the man who knows the global rice market. And he says that we can eliminate that, that, that rice import into Africa in its entirety. You know, it adds a new, it adds a new layer of force. 
you know, one of the other things I wanted to cover with you was the issue. Well, okay, what does this book? You were in Washington. What does this book mean for a Washington audience? It's, you, you were in New York yesterday. There's sort of a different kind of a conversation in New York. It's related, but it, it's slightly different. Um, you know, one uh, one thing I would propose that I think we ought to take away from after reading this book is okay. And I go back to what I was saying earlier about China which is, like I said, is a little bit of catnip here in Washington, yep. the China-Africa relationship. I certainly gravitate towards that. I want to understand that. My take on the China-Africa relationship isn't for the United States to complain about it. My view is, OK, how do we combine the great work OPIC does, and Mimi Alamayu is the EVP. She's here. I want to recognize her. Uh, the great work that AID does. Uh, and I think one of the things that's not in the book, or at least as, as well, I think well described, is I think there's been a massive set of investments, and you, you're, not, you're not focused on foreign assistance at all in the book, exactly. but I think there have been a series of significant contributions that the U.S. government have made, whether it's to training of Africans or Feed the Future here in this administration, but also PEPFAR in the Bush administration, uh, AGOA under the Clinton administration, been a series of things that have helped I think undergird some of the success yeah. in Africa. I don't think we can, we are a small supporting actor, but I do think we need to do a far better job to the extent we are supporting Africa and the African drama of linking up at OPIC, AID, MCC, XM, and TDA, and, and my friend Thelma Askey, who's an affiliation here with CSIS, who's the former head of TDA, is with us as well. That we need to, we need to, we're going to be talking about that a little bit on Friday with Gail Smith, who's going to be with us, and we're going to be talking about the partnership for growth work. But I, I, that was one of my takeaways because I, it seems to me that we can't just complain and say, oh, why are they doing this? And this is quote unquote bad. It just behooves us to, to sort of up our game as Americans and so the American policy community. That was my takeaway. Yeah, so uh, let's start with that and we can talk about some other yeah. specific policies. But before we get to those policies, let's, let's talk about the, China-Africa relationship and the U.S.-Africa relationship. Yeah. So uh, you're quite right, Dan. I think we do ourselves a pretty significant competitive disservice when we m portray the, the Chinese relationship in Africa as either bad for Africa or wholesale due to corruption. Uh, there's a story I relate in the book in which I was sitting at an event uh, that, that was celebrating U.S.-Africa trade. There are sometimes more events celebrating U.S.-Africa trade than U.S.-Africa trade. <laughs> But uh, uh, this was this was one <laughs> such, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, and um, uh, at this event, we the keynote the keynote speaker was a a statesman uh, of of global reputation in the U S. You know, U S. statesman. Everybody that shall here, go unnamed. He will, or she, or she. Uh, uh, everyone here would know this person's name, and uh, as as uh, the as the statesman was speaking. He paused from his own from his prepared remarks and said, "You know, I know that you all have a relationship. You know, I know that China has been acti newly active in in Africa. I just want you to know that we're not like them. They're there only for the money uh, and the resources. Not like us. <laughs> not like us. Right. Not like us. Leaving aside for a moment the veracity of, of of the statement, what I found that statement that that what I found that statesman was really missing is how much that is exactly what Africans and African executives want." How much appetite they have for exactly a relationship that is about trade, that is about equals, and how much dignity they tell me that confers upon them. I can't tell you how many times I heard that in the course of writing the book. Exactly that. Uh, from some of the people who were there in that, in that very room. So I, I, I think that that sort of masks what, what we could be doing in terms, of a, in terms of our competitiveness there. And by the way, we are extremely competitive in Africa. Uh, both in terms of the kinds of skills we bring, particularly our ability to, ra to, do, to, to, to deliver human capital improvements, training and education. We're world beaters at that, and there's few things that African governments and, frankly, African, African business partners want more than human capital improvement programs. We're great at that. We're great at all kinds of technologies that, are, uh, that need to be deployed in Africa. But probably more importantly, th there's a certain soft power advantage there. I wrote about this recently in Harvard yeah. Business Review. The American brand is, is, is uh, resonant and, and with African, particularly with African entrepreneurs, at least the ones I spoke with. It's remarkable how familiar they are with sort of the mythology of rugged individualism, of entrepreneurialism, of the story of building this continent, which is part of why I think it resonates there, because they're building a continent. 
I, I, it, it, was, it was remarkable to me how often they would bring it up without my discussing it. That's a big advantage. You know, you don't, it's hard to quantify. You can see it in polling data for sure. But from a commercial perspective, it's an opening that, that Americans could take advantage of. You know, let me, let me just cover one last question, then I want to open up. There's some very thoughtful people, and I have half a mind to call on, on some, very, some, some people. I'm looking at them and, and making sure I want to make sure we get, get to some, some very uh, thoughtful resources here in the, the audience. Uh, okay, we're, uh, it's 9-11. We talked about this. We said, okay, are we going to do an event on 9-11? And as I said to you on the phone, I said, I got into the development business, and I got into the cause of development because of 9-11. Talk a little bit about the, this is a hopeful story. This is a story about hope. This is a story about the future. Is there some, is there something, to, is there something that, that, that when you think about 9-11 and you think about the book, what, what, what comes to mind for you? Yeah. Uh, so we did talk about this. 9-11 is an important date for, for everybody, I'm sure. Yes. Important date for me. I think about it every, you know, think about it every year. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, yesterday I, I was telling Dan just, just before we came in, yesterday uh, I had my first interview for the book on the Mike Huckabee radio show. So, uh, you know, that, that, that audience is a different one than the one we find, our, when we find in the room today. Uh, There's but, some overlap. Yep. <laughs> that's right. You said you listen. Bipartisan. Right? Bipartisan yeah. show. That's right. That's right. But it's also a broad audience, a general, a widespread American audience. And I was very interested in how Governor Huckabee, a, pr a pretty terrific communicator, would communicate this story to them. Yeah. And he was in the midst of a lot of what was, what was being discussed around the Syrian crisis. And what he said is, you know, if you're interested, all he, all he introduced it very simply by saying, if you're interested in a good news story about the world, here's one, here's one that may surprise you. And that was his, his lead in for success in Africa. It's odd that, you know, having worked on this for a year, I never thought of it quite that way. But, uh, you know, for, for, for all the unevenness of African development, it is a good news story. And it's a good news story that mostly reinforces the things that I think that I, I personally find are core to the American value around entrepreneurialism and opportunity and the liberty to explore it. Now, we don't always get that right. I might argue we never get it exactly right. But those are aspirations that I think uh, uh, were celebrated in the wake of 9-11. Rather than focusing on the tragedy, I'd rather focus on you know, what, what, what's uplifting coming out of it. Those are things that were, I think, properly celebrated by us and by people around the world in the wake of 9-11 that I find resonant in Africa today. Yeah. Okay, I want to I want to open this up. I'm I want to just I want to first uh, as a privilege ask ask my friend and colleague Jen Cook if you either wanted to make a comment or ask a question. I wanted to ask you if you would you would, if you put the first question. So yeah. thank you for investing your time. And thanks for being here. Let, let, let me also say that I, re I recognize Jen from her work and Tony I've known for for many years. I know there's a lot of expertise in this room that matches or surpasses my own. So I I, I encourage you to make your own points and, and, and certainly take issue with mine. Yeah, the, the softball questions are now ending. Right, right. exactly. I know that Dan will treat me with kick gloves, but you guys don't have to. Go ahead, Jen. No, I mean, thanks so much, and, and thanks, Dan, uh, for putting this together. And I'm, I'm really eager to read the book. I mean, I think a lot of what you're saying resonates um, kind of with what I'm thinking, particularly on, on the China, on the the... I was just at a congressional retreat in Ethiopia with a number of Congress people, and, and immediately China, and I gave a talk on China, immediately the question of China and the suspicion of China's motives and what, how are they undercutting all the good work we've done in Africa was kind of a, a subtext to some of that. And, um, you know, I think, I think you're absolutely right. The U.S. has uh, uh, tremendous advantages in, in some ways, and I think the the advance of China in some of the big lucrative industries is very much overplayed in some ways. They've made huge advances from where they were. But the U.S. has a tremendous base of investment in the extractive industries and in the oil industry and the mining industry and so forth. That, um, and so when we talk about China gobbling up the resources and undercutting all the good we've done, we're, we're actually there doing a lot of that and selling eventually to China, even if our, our need for, for oil um, goes down. So I'd love to read the, maybe you can say a bit more about China and kind of attitudes for China and where you see the trajectory going. One of the fears for some of the growth story is not that China will do more and more in Africa, but what happens when China slows down? Slows down, right. And, um, right. Uh, you know, the, the big opportunities for the United States. Uh, Why don't we bunch a couple questions together? We'll do this World sure. Bank style. 
Tony Carroll, and I'm hoping Mimi will also make, so make you know, a comment as well. I think a few notes as people are talking, yeah. so I keep them together. Yep. Oh, I look forward to reading your book. Thanks, Jonathan, and, and Dan, thank you for organizing this thoughtful session. Um, I'm reading, I look forward to reading this book because I just finished the book, How Nations Fail, mm. uh, which is, you know, great reading. And I'm just wondering if this new cadre of business leadership is starting to have its impact on political leadership. You know, I think one of the constraints certainly pointed out in that book, and I don't know how novel a thought that really is, is that you might find dynamic business leadership, but when you get to political leadership, it pretty much looks like the same it did 25, 30 years ago. And are, are you getting a sense that the business agenda and the business visionaries are starting to have a greater impact in creating what I think are the remaining institutional constraints on African development? And then the last thing, and it's my bigaboo on, on this whole area of an American engagement in Africa, is this whole social capital crowd. You know, it, you know, to me, it drives me almost nuts at times because the implication is we're going to do this because if it's a social capital investment means there's something inherently bad about Africa. And why are we, you know, treating Africa differently than we would elsewhere? And I'm sorry, John Simon will probably knock me in the head next time he sees me if he's in the room. But I, I just really wonder whether or not um, our engagement in Africa still hasn't really changed as an investment lens. It's still sort of seen as a development game. Yeah. And I'm a little worried about that. Mimi, do have it behind you. Thank you, Dan, and thank you for, for doing this. I haven't read your book, so I, I will not comment on that. But I would just sort of add maybe perhaps to the good story uh, what your book talks about in terms of opportunities and where Africa is today. Um, OPIC, I don't know how many of you know about OPIC. It's the US government's development finance institution. It was started by Nixon over 40 years ago. And it's actually been active in Africa for the 40 years. And for the first time in OPIC's 40-year history, Africa became our largest portfolio. It's fantastic. Um, overtaking Latin America, which has always kind of been around 30, 30% of our portfolio. We have about 16 billion in our exposure, and 4 billion of it is now in Sub-Saharan Africa. And like most other institutions, we also separate North Africa from, unfortunately, the, the rest of Africa. So what that says really is, you know, we're very much demand-driven we go where our clients want us to go. The fact that Africa is our largest portfolio says something about where the continent is, uh, is going. And it's not your usual, and we have the GEs of the world as our clients, but we also have really SMEs that are going into the continent for the first time, that have done business in Latin America, that have done business in Asia, and that are, you know, don't, don't want to miss this boat. But also I think another point that I think Dan sort of alluded to is the diaspora. Mm. That some of them you met, the James Wan and James Wangi actually I, I know him well. He's, I think, has been in Kenya for a long time. And Tony Illumilo, but there's also other diasporas that were trained in New York or in Washington that were educated here, that have gone back and that are including my brother who moved back like you know about seven years ago. Who I never imagined in my lifetime my brother would pack up and move to Ethiopia and start a business and now almost employs the same number of people as OPIC. But <laughs> you know, Amazing. so there's a lot of good stories and even at OPIC we're seeing that increasingly our clients are becoming some of the diaspora investors, those that are not necessarily moving back, but that are making really sophisticated, long-term, complex investments. They're not just wiring money to their grandmother, as a lot of people think of the diaspora. So I think that's, that's a, a really important element that's taking place, this brain drain, the opposite of the brain, the, the brain gain, I mean, the opposite of the brain drain that Africa faced for decades. So that's taking place. So I think it's, you know, it's all around, it's, I could say it's, it's, a, it's a really good story. Thank you. Could I just ask, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, I have a bad head cold. I wonder if someone might bring me a tissue. Is that possible? Yeah. I thought the question Thanks. was for me. No, no. <laughs> By the way, today is September 11, and it's Ethiopian New Year. OK. Um, so that's also a positive thing to think about and, and sort of a, the other well. side of the coin. Let me point out that Mimi's brother Thanks. employs as many people in OPIC in an office <laughs> about half this size. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna. There's. A, I want to do a second round after uh, Jonathan answers this this first round of questions. I would. I'm gonna. I'm gonna call on Michael and, and Thelma, and I'm gonna ask Bob Berg as well to comment, and we'll do also do another round after that. So I'll make sure we get to a lot of different folks. But Jonathan. Yeah. So uh, I th I thought those were all three great points. I'm not surprised given who the the speakers were. Maybe I I actually think there's a bit of a linkage between what Tony and Mimi were saying, and then maybe I'd just come back and reflect a little bit on your question. So. Uh, 
Tony, yeah, I agree with you that there's still we're still playing a lot of a development game, uh, and I more more than I, there there is an element. Listen, I think there's a place in the world for humanitarian aid and philanthropic aid and impact investing, uh, but I think that the balance of uh, those to straightforward trade investment in Africa still lags behind uh, the the op, not only the optimal but the opportunity for America, and that's what I'm focused on really is the American opportunity there. Uh, <clears throat> pardon me. You know, the president's trip uh, was fo was f to be focused on trade and aid, uh, the, and and I think it was largely. But I, for example, had a friend in Senegal who said, "You know what? I I, I would like the president to come and not visit the the uh, you know the the exit point for slave trades for a change, just so he clearly signals that that's not what we're doing. I would like him to not visit the Mandela prison on Robben Island because that's not what that's not what Africa's future is about, and then send a very clear signal the same way he does." When he goes to ASEAN, for example, that resonated with me, and I think that so I think that's right. I think we are saying the right things, but the message is still not perfectly clear, and I think that's reflected. You know, I'm 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 not a Washington bureau person. In Washington bureaucrat, bureaucratic structures, yeah, that, they, they, they they merit attention. I'm not the I'm not the expert on them, but I will say that it seemed to me that as I looked at the structure for how. The president's major initiatives were being delivered, were, were to be delivered, coming out of uh, his trip in, in late June, early July. A lot of it rested with USAID, the Agency for International Development, and I found myself wondering, well, why isn't it a little more in OPEC and EXIM, frankly? Uh, you know, I, I'm not a, I, that was not a paid sponsor. Was this a, was this a tee up? You? Right. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, uh, you know, and I'm, I listen. I, I have a lot of respect for colleagues who are at USAID. But if we're really shifting to a trade and aid, a trade and investment focus, it seems to me those are the engines by which we do trade and investment. And by the way, I, I guess I kind of don't understand where the Department of Commerce is in this. We, we seem not to have an entity that really is responsible for driving a trade and, agenda, a trade and investment agenda really divorced from, uh, from development. It seems to me like we could. All of that, actually, is a little bit more, one might say, like the Chinese model. I, I think we have what, frankly, I think we have what to learn from how the Chinese engage with Africa, not only in the soft area of imparting dignity in the relationship, which I'm sure there's many people who have had different, different experiences, but that's the experience I've encountered, uh, but also in the degree to which so much of their relationship is premised on commercial transaction, including loans. Most of, the, most of the, what's called development assistance from Africa for the purposes of comparison, is really much more like what Mimi's organization does. Or Exim than, Bank. Or Exim Bank than, than, than what uh, USAID does. Now, I'm not saying we should take on the, the Chinese model whole cloth. Uh, you know, I think we have our, we, 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 there are good reasons we do the things we do, uh, and they have strengths to them. But I think it could be a little bit, a, a little bit more that way. Um, you know, th that would be my one reflection on China. The, uh, another is just I do find it a little ironic that we found ourselves decrying the upswing of Chinese investment in Africa, and now we're decrying with terror that there might be a downswing of investment in of China, Chinese investment in Africa. You know, there clearly is, there clearly is a, a sort of an absence of clear-cut thinking on it. Okay, so let me see. I'd like uh, to hear from Thelma Askey first, please. Thelma, you're the f you have an affiliation here with CSIS, but you also were the former head of TDA, and then you had a stint on the Hill as well as a, you were a senior official at OECD in Paris. Hi. <laughs> uh, I want to kind of uh, approach China in a different way, but also overall in Africa, set aside the development side, sorry, which, we, which the U.S. kind of focuses on. What kind of assistance can we give to U.S. business to make them interested in Africa? And I was particularly interested in what you said about Nagra, I mean, the, uh, Magra, excuse me, the northern uh, uh, Africa part and how they're expanding into Africa, uh, uh, sub central sub-Saharan Africa. Yes. What is it that they see uh, that's a plus for them? And what is South Africa mm -hmm. not seeing? The difference, the primary difference between China and the U.S. <coughs> is Excuse me. The U.S. is only going to help U.S. business so much, and then they're going to have to be business people. China perhaps has other goals in Africa and will support. I mean, Chinese businesses are yeah, necessarily uh, 
So if, if the US business person is looking at Africa, what is it that North Africa is seeing about expanding? Are they being supported by the government too, or, or, or do they see some kind of real business opportunity? I'm not so impressed by the cell phone thing, although I think it's very important to connectivity. But you know, cell phones expanded in Europe first, primarily because telecommunication was so bad there. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, can be Africa's story too. You know, it, it's for, you know, it's a good thing but it's not necessarily reflective of a, a vibrancy within uh, the economy. It's more of a reflection of necessity. You can correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. but you know, they, they jump to cell phones because they have no underlying mm -hmm. you know, telecommunication Le there. It's a good thing, but it's not necessarily reflective of a v vibrant economy that's there. But I'm the most interested in what is it from an entrepreneurial standpoint, the, the lone U.S. business person without government assistance, without USTDA, without <laughs> XM, even without OPEC, uh, what what should they see in Africa? Besides, they love us. They love our entrepreneurial yeah. spirit, uh, yeah. and and we should. Yeah. Bob, please, if you pass the microphone to my friend Bob Berg. Back there. Hi, Dan. Um, Bob Bird, former senior advisor of the UN Economic Commission for Africa. A uh, quick comment and a, and a quick question. Comment is, this reinforces my view that the work, Dan, that you did on post-aid relationships really needs to keep at it. And maybe, you know, we ought to think about what it, take a case in point and recommend to the government. What is, what is, what, what are the implications of a change relationship with Ghana, given its oil? Yeah. What, what kind of relationship should we be having it? The question is, and I'll, I'll be happy to work with you. Yes, exactly. <laughs> the question is this. The UN uh, post-2015 uh, Millennium Development Goals are, are recommending two big areas. One is uh, uh, more broad-based growth. Uh, Livelihoods so is sort of life, yeah, within but, that. You know, involving the poorest and so forth. And the second is the reductions in violence and, and, and putting in national institutions and other and ways to kind of reduce uh, violence. I must say in our own country, it's, we'd be hard pressed to say, you know, what are we doing on these scores? So I'm just wondering whether these topics came up in conversations with the entrepreneurs that you dealt with, and whether they have ideas about how to address those topics in their own societies. Could you repeat the topics again? The topics are reduction in violence yeah. and more broad-based growth, wider employment, dealing with poverty, yeah. all that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, and I agree with you, Bob. We'll, we'll follow up on that. And M Michael Levitt, who's got an affiliation here with CSIS and the former president and CEO of, of uh, CDC Development Solutions. Um, I apologize both for not having read the book and for <laughs> coming in a little late. Uh, just two points. One. I work on both the private sector side and with, with development. And um, our office in Ghana, the business card, our business card says, across the street from the Dynasty restaurant. Mm. It's not just the big Chinese companies that are affecting perceptions of Chinese in it. It's large numbers of Chinese living there, working there, building their own businesses that has a huge impact, I think. Second, competitive advantage, I think, often in uh, with some of the infrastructure work I've been involved in on the American side and Chinese side, is we have a quality, I think we send out a quality message that wins and that I think has an effect on government leaders. And then the last thing, and this is the question, I've been working there since 1973, and I don't see much difference in corruption. And that's my biggest thing in lack of change, whether businesses grow or we've done a wonderful thing with PEPFAR, which we have, and all this other stuff, um, it, it's, you're killed by corruption. And I, I, I'm hoping you're going to say, I've found massive change. Please. OK, why don't we take those three? OK. Mm -hmm. 
good. So why don't we take them kind of in sequence? Because I think I think concluding with corruption is uh, on, on this round anyway is not 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 a reasonable thing to do. It's pretty pre pretty central. Uh, in terms of what the North Africans see uh, as they expand southward, yeah, so first of all, I think you're right that the, at least the companies that I engaged with are doing so with no government support other than other than acquiescence, other than when saying yes, we'd like to see you move south, but without further further support than that. Uh, what what they see is growth, is growth opportunities. So the companies, in particular, that I'm talking about, are agri are uh, the investments they're making are in agribusiness and in financial services, particularly financial services to the to the unbanked or marginally banked. Those are growth opportunities in Africa, and to me, they speak to a dynamic that's a little different than the one you described. I, I, I thought that you you know, and I may be misinterpreting you, but but what I understood you to be saying is you know phone phone. The, the, the rise of cell phones came as a function of necessity rather than vibrancy. To me, those two things are, are part and parcel of one another. Necessity drives vibrancy. And this is one of the great misconceptions about opportunity in Africa. Uh, you know, Chris Karubi, one of, the, one of the richest men in East Africa, said, you know, you go, you go where the markets, you know, the, mar the markets that have nothing are very important. They're the ones that buy everything. So, you know, and I think that you see that dynamic all over Africa Foreign firms aren't always the first to jump on it. I mean, I think there's a reason that uh, equity banks sort of stole the thunder from global banks, even even South African banks, in reaching out to the unbanked. They just didn't see that. They weren't able to capture that opportunity. So, and I think to the extent, and I think that to the extent that there is widespread opportunity in Africa, that is the opportunity. And I think that relates a little bit to uh, what Mr. Burton was saying about inclusive growth. There are opportunities to serve elites in Africa and to serve only international firms that are coming in. Uh, I, I, in fact, one, the CEO of a global bank who is not named in the book, but this, I think this story is in there. I said it, it, it is in the, in the book. <laughs> Good. Well, it's memorable. Book, it's I memorable. But I didn't name him, right. That I, uh, 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 so this when I, bank, this leader. Yes. Yeah, yeah, a US global banking leader. Uh, uh, when he said, you know, oh yeah, we have an Africa, you know, I was asked to speak with him because they are moving strongly into Africa, and he said, and, and so I met with him, and he said, we are moving strongly into Africa, our client, or our global clients are demanding it. And I said, that's great, you know, while you're there, are, are you thinking of banking anybody else? And he sort of blinked at me and said, well, who else is there? Right? I, th I actually think that that, that, that prevails in a, across a large number of companies. Uh, the companies that I spoke with for the book, and this is, was in a certain sense self-selective, are not that way. They, 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 to a company, are in one way or another uh, focused on building what one of them calls social wealth uh, in the country. That's not social capital. I mean like broad-based broad inclusive growth. Each of their activities is in, in one form or another delivering productivity or life-enhancing uh, uh, products and services to millions, right? Be it broadband or privatized health or education or power. I mean, nothing could be more empowering to millions than broad-based power on and off grid. I, I, they're not doing that in order to in order to help society, though I think that's very they're very conscious of it. I find that there's a very easy flow amongst African executives between the core of their business and what we typically would think of as the social mission of the business. They're not as distinguished, perhaps because poverty is so widespread, but there's a much more holistic interaction between the two. Again, I don't want to be too Pollyannish mm -hmm. about it. There are plenty of people making money uh, serving only the elites in Africa. There are plenty of people making money doing nefarious things. But there is a, but to, to, from, from, from what I gauge, Neither of those is where the largest opportunity lies. The largest opportunity lies in, in delivering productive goods and services to millions of people who are just coming up the productivity uh, chain. Uh, on the way there, there are, uh, is a lot of corruption. So before I speak about corruption in any other country, I, I like to just take a pause to say that I, I, I'm pretty conscious and painfully, painfully conscious of the corruption in our own system. Uh, there's, it, I find it a little difficult to hear Americans bring up corruption again and again in Africa when our own campaign, campaign finance system is so clearly uh, rotting. So with that, with that in mind, uh, there is corruption everywhere and there is corruption in Africa. My experience of this, Michael, and you've been, you know, I, 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 you've been at this a long time in many different uh, parts of the continent, so I, I have a lot of respect for your opinion. My, my experience of this, 
uh, is that there has always been a channel through which transparent, uh, good, transparent clean operations can, can thrive, that transparent companies can, clean, can compete and win, and that that channel is widening. And it's widening for two reasons. One is because more companies are going through it. I think you'll find you know, companies, uh, I think GE operates cleanly. I think that uh, ECP, uh, Tom Gibeon's firm, the private equity firm based here in, in Washington, operates cleanly and is and, you know, all over the continent on private equity pre-IPO you know, pre placements all over the continent. Those are two of the companies that are interviewed in the, con in, 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 in the book. Mo Ibrahim clearly has sort of made this enormous stand and built a billion dollar enterprise in Celtel by operating cleanly and then went on to establish a foundation to promote it. I, I, you know, if you, you could probably find incidences with, with each of those companies that would challenge what I've just said, but I think the overall, I think you'd find the overall theme of all three is along those lines. And I think the more, I find anyway, the more companies that move through the channel, the wider it gets. It's, it's the opposite of zero sum, right? It's win-win. I also heard in this book, and maybe this was a bit of a surprising finding, that uh, they heard a lot of pull from, the gover from governments, governments that surprised me, uh, for, for, clean gov for clean, transparent business. I'll give two examples. Uh, they both have to do with Nigeria, right? Sort of the, what many people think of as the poster child for corruption. So Ken Androgo runs a, a mobile company in Kenya called Cellulant that delivers mobile solutions for a variety of companies. And he was asked to come bid on delivering a mobile solution for the fertilizer subsidy in Nigeria, the government subsidy that is passed to farmers. Nothing could be more rife with corruption than that story. Uh, he described a process of go, bring, coming into country, delivering a presentation to Governor Sanusi, the head of the central bank. I mean, if we want to talk about you know, the quality of governance going up in Africa, I think we ought, you ought to look at Governor Sanusi of, of the Central Bank of Nigeria. And to, uh, and, and to Ngozi, to the finance minister, and to the minister of agriculture. And a process that was uh, uh, as, as uninterrupted by, by corruption as you could hope for. It was, just, it was just a technocratic process. Similarly, the head of GE Africa, who does business overwhelmingly with, with government, selling large infrastructure power projects to government, said that he is finding that government, at least at the top levels, are demanding more transparency from him. They want a more transparent bid that's submitted. They want more transparency in who, his, in, in, in who is going to be in his consortium, how they're going to be paid, right? The, it's actually a pull for more transparency. Now, I suspect that that is happening much more at the top of bureaucracies, and it's a little harder as it gets further down. But I also think that just as the fish rots from the head, it also purifies from the head. So th those are my experiences with it. But there's a lot of experience here in the room, so I'm certainly open to pushback. So let me just um, remember the title is Success in Africa by Jonathan Berman. I hope you're going to buy copies of the book retail and go to politics and press. I want to take one last question. Uh, Jonathan, you've got a few minutes to stick around to, yes. to chat. So let's, I'm looking over here on this side of the, the room. I've, I've been focused over here, so I want to show a little room equity, if you will, and make sure I've, I've covered everybody on this side. Anybody have a comment or question on this side? Yes, sir. Hi, thanks. I'm wondering if you might, especially given your, uh, your last response, refine the critique um, offered originally by the gentleman over there, but um, of U.S. engagement and Africa as being too development oriented, is it, is it simply a matter of the mechanism we use to you know, conduct transactions that, that we're doing things through U.S. aid, who I think is increasingly becoming more, more focused on the private sector and business <coughs> um, strictly anyway, um, but what exactly are we suggesting as you responded yourself that, that businesses in Africa and CEOs see both development and their core missions and their core, their bottom line is being very intertwined. What are we suggesting might be a different approach? Mm -hmm. You want to take several or why don't we just take that one on? Why don't, we, why don't we take one more for bonus here? Anybody else got a last comment or question? Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Pierre Tonchu. I'm here at CSIS Africa program. Um, I just wanted to, I wanted us to expand, not expand, but I think we, when we think about competition in Africa, we tend to focus a little too much on just China. I think that um, the U.S. needs also to recognize that 
within the West, the France and the UK are still relevant on the continent. And maybe that's something that we need to look at when we're talking about the US being, um, having a unique approach to human capacity building. <coughs> that's something that's also done by those other Western mm -hmm. powers. So I, I do agree that the US has a soft power that is maybe greater than those other Western powers, but what else um, differentiates the US from those Western powers? Why do African countries, um, why would they look to the US as a, as a partner um, over those other Western powers? Yeah. yeah. Good. It's a good way to end it, actually, that question in particular. So why don't we take it in, in that order? That's the toughest one to me. I know, okay. I know, but, okay. but we'll it's a good we'll question. Get, we'll, get, we'll get set up on it. So uh, I liked your question about is it, is it an issue of the mechanism? You caused me to reflect. I, I don't think it's primarily an issue of the mechanism. I think it's a mindset. Uh, so in terms of mechanism, you know, Russia is a very, very capable private sector experience with, with driving private sector capabilities into USAID. I can perfectly believe that AID would be a good mechanism through which to deliver our, our relationship. Though fundamentally, I think our relationship should be more about New York and Silicon Valley than about Washington, right? I think, I think the day in which a, African executives are not meeting here, but meeting in one of those places, is the day th is that you, you know change has happened, right? So fundamentally, there's the, whole, the, the, whole, the whole paradigm ought to be shifting. But in terms of US policy itself, let me give you two examples of the mindset that I think is a little wrong still, still. And these are both very recent, and, I, and they're both th about the Obama administration, though I don't think they're alone in this regard. So when, in the run-up to the Kenyan election earlier this year, uh, President Obama sent a message to the people of Kenya, right, wishing them well, and cautioning them not to resort to violence. Uh, the Kenyan people didn't need to be cautioned not to resort to violence. And I knew a number of Kenyans. I asked them afterwards, what do you, what do you feel about our, our President's message? And they, 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 they found it a little bit, um, yeah, condes I mean, it, was, it was condescending sounding. To be, to be instructed not to, not to slaughter one another. Now, I don't know if the president was watching too much of CNN's hype about how much slaughter there would be, but it just, I didn't feel the president was well served in, in, in delivering the message that way. Second uh, is a, a program that came out of the recent, the recent uh, presidential visit, the Young Africa, actually it, pre it precedes it, but they're gonna heighten it up, the Young African Leadership Initiative. This is a, a, an initiative, I think very well, well, well conceived initiative to bring African, leadership with public and private sector here to receive you know to receive training and education uh, but it's framed in exactly that way they're going to come here and learn so that they can bring our lessons back home well you know that the truth is we pretty badly need to learn how to do business in fast growth markets and they know a lot about it and wouldn't it have been great if that same program would have been framed in that way and and executed in that way i didn't see it so to, to, to me, there, those, are, the, the, those are two opportunities, very well-intentioned, and, and I think it was right to be initiating both of those, both a message to Kenya on the eve of its election and, this, and a program to trade, to trade young leadership. Uh, but they were executed in a way that tells me we still have a ways to go in terms of the, the right mindset. Talk about uh, other actors on the continent. You, you actually talk a little bit about it in the book. Talk a just briefly about that. We, do, we should wrap it up. But OK, I will. So uh, I, I, it did occur to me when I finished writing the book that I had written a chapter, what about China, what about America? And I had not written a chapter, what about Europe? Uh, for one thing, perhaps we'll wait for the, for the French language edition for me to add another chapter. Uh, but uh, I, I will say this about that. Uh, I, I, the relationship of the U.S. to our European allies in, in all matters, but, and particularly in development, is uh, a powerful and a useful tool and one we should deepen and continue. Having said that, I actually believe that the U.S. sometimes suffers from association with the European approach to development. I think that that, that approach is rooted in a lot of history. It trucks, it, 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 it trucks a lot of uh, connotations some good, some bad, from both the African side and the European side, and that Amer the American approach to Africa often falls within it. And I, I'll just cite one example of that. I can, I, I can tell you that not one, but several CEOs mentioned to me in, in when talking about the US-Africa relationship, an incident in which a, uh, an ambassador really uh, denigrated the Kenyan, presidents, the Kenyan president and his cabinet by saying they were, quote, vomiting on the shoes of their donors in the way in which they were executing the donor aid. 
the problem is that ambassador was not American. That ambassador was British. Uh, he was a British high commissioner. But, but that was lost entirely on, on the executives I was talking to. So it was, we were conflated. We were sort of guilt by association. Yeah, that's right, in that, in that particular case. Now, as I say, that really, the, the, I, I do not want to go so far as to put daylight between us and our close collaborators and allies on development. But I would say that the US has a unique opportunity to sort of define, uh, and perhaps is uniquely positioned, to define an interaction that is fundamentally different from that one. Well, on that point, thank you very much, Jonathan. And please join me in thanking Jonathan Berman. Thank you. Thank you, John. OK. Sure. Thank you. Thank you.